So it's my honor this afternoon to welcome Dr. Mark McClellan as our afternoon keynote speaker, who is yet another highlight to uh, a day of many, many highlights. Dr. McClellan, as you know, is director of the Engelbert Center for Healthcare Reform, uh, Leonard D. Schaefer Chair in Health Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution. At the center, his work focuses on promoting high quality, innovative, and affordable healthcare. A doctor and economist by training, he also has a highly distinguished record in public service and in academic research, including in roles as former administrator of CMS and former commissioner of FDA. During his tenure in public service, Dr. McClellan developed and implemented major reforms in health policy, including the Medicare prescription drug benefit, the FDA's critical path initiative, and public-private initiatives to develop better information on the quality and cost of care. He also previously served as a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors and Senior Director for Healthcare Policy at the White House and was an Associate Professor of Economics and Medic Medicine at Stanford University. Please join me in welcoming Mark McClellan. Thanks very much, uh, Mar. Uh, thanks very much, Marcia. It's uh, great to be here with you. I was also going to say it's great to be here with Marge Fodi and uh, the American Association for Cancer Research and the Personalized Medicine Coalition. Uh, Ed Abrams, Jeff Kostman, uh, many of you who I've enjoyed working with over the years. Uh, I hope after what you've seen today that there's a renewed sense of optimism about the progress that's being made towards personalized medicine. Uh, after uh, it's actually very difficult to follow, Dr. Sid. Uh, Mukherjee about after uh, his description of the arc and the art of scientific progress in cancer care and the challenges ahead. Um, this is going to get a, a little bit more practical. For those of you who have heard me talk before, you know that I try to put a lot of emphasis on the policy steps and the, the sort of the, the, the implementation steps, how we get from here to there uh, in terms of taking this uh, tremendous potential for scientific progress and personalized care that can affect uh, individual patients into uh, better support in real world clinical settings. And so that's what I want to cover now. I'm going to do my, you know, as you all know, or many of you know, I come from four generations of very fast talking Texans. And since we're behind a little bit on the schedule, I'm going to keep the, the, the uh, pace going pretty quickly. Uh, but I do want to talk about the intersection between some of the fundamentals in science that you all have been talking about a lot this morning, as well as the fundamentals of economics and, and budgeting that are going to have an impact on where uh, healthcare and medical innovation go from here. And then I want to emphasize some leadership areas related to policy. So you've heard a lot about the science. You've also heard some really good ideas and perspectives about uh, policy changes, uh, uh, actions that the public sector and the private sector can take to, to speed up progress towards more personalized and effective cancer care. Uh, I want to highlight some of those points now. And you've got a great panel uh, following me, and I want to help you get to them as soon as possible, too. So uh, that's a, a brief overview of what I want to cover. Uh, let's start with the budget fundamental and the economic fundamental. This is a chart some of you may have seen. There's a, uh, th this uh, latest version just came out from CBO uh, 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 last week that divides everything the federal government spends money on into three categories. The red is Medicare, Medicaid, the, the new subsidies under the exchanges with the Affordable Care Act, uh, basically all the major health care spending. Uh, the uh, light blue is Social Security. The dark blue is everything else. That includes defense spending, all uh, non-defense discretionary spending, including biomedical research, infrastructure, things like that, all of our low-income assistance programs, uh, education, and the like. And what you can see is over, you know, no, no surprise here, uh, over the years, spending on uh, health care-related programs has gone up. Um, you can see, see if i got a pointer here. Uh, maybe, maybe not, but... Uh, I am. I'm not going to be able to figure that out. I uh, can't, can't talk and move my hand at the same, in, in a precise direction at the same time. But you see that big spike uh, around 2008. So that was the, the Great Recession. And now we're coming down, uh, coming up to that, uh, the, the, the fiscal cliff on the other side. This is the spending side of the fiscal cliff. There's also a big tax side. Um, and uh, uh, what you can see, though, is going forward, the, the big story is going to be uh, health care spending. So fiscal policy for this country going forward is largely going to be determined by and influenced by health care policy, and that includes the support and uh, financing that we provide for innovation. Uh, remember that NIH spending and research spending is in that bottom blue category that 
under current law is getting squeezed a lot. If healthcare spending continues, uh, it could be squeezed a lot more. By the way, uh, it may not look like it, but there's a lot of optimism embodied in this figure. Uh, the healthcare figures presume that the level of tightening of spending that the current law has in Medicare, which includes things like the so-called sustainable growth rate, which isn't for physician payment, and uh, the tighter payments across all other types of healthcare providers that was included to help pay for some of the expansion costs uh, of the ACA, that those are going to continue indefinitely. Uh, if you look at the CBO's alternative forecast and some of the projections from the Medicare actuaries, that, that red part gets a lot redder. Uh, this is a chart for the federal government. I could show you something similar for states where, you know, just the same Medicaid and the, the, the state health care programs uh, for retirees and so forth are getting big. Everything else that states do is getting squeezed. So that's the, the, the pressure on the, the fiscal side. Um, on the other side, though, and this is, this is the, really the rock and the hard place, and this is even more important, uh, I think, for determining where our nation's health care policies have gone and certainly will be important for the future, is even though we're spending a lot more on health care and have spent a lot more over time, time, uh, we seem to be getting an awful lot for it. Now, I know you talked some this morning about uh, how you put a value on progress, a value on improvements and outcomes versus the cost. Um, for this kind of analysis, these are, this is a compilation of a lot of studies that economists have done about the value of innovation. It really doesn't matter what you assume uh, when you look at sort of overall changes in the way that we treat just about every diseases. On one hand, costs have generally gone up. Uh, while uh, prevention uh, to many holds hope for holding down costs in the future, uh, the fact is, is we have more diagnostic tests, more things that we can do uh, to head off the complications of illnesses. Uh, costs have generally gone up. At the same time, outcomes have improved a lot, a whole lot, uh, relative to the cost of improvement in care. So. Uh, take cardiovascular disease, that's the first column, or heart attacks, that's the third column. Uh, even with very conservative assumptions about how much living longer and living better is worth to people, uh, the, the increase in cost versus the improvements in outcomes are ratios of like one to seven, one to five. Well worth it, well beyond worth it. Uh, overall, uh, if you look at some economist studies um, of the macro uh, picture for the healthcare system, the improvements in healthcare overall have been uh, more than an order of magnitude greater than the improvements, than the increases in costs. So, you know, over the last 40 or 50 years, yeah, we've got jet travel and, and iPads and all kinds of cool internet stuff. Uh, but what people really enjoy is more time to use those things and more time with their family members to enjoy the sunsets and uh, everything else that the, the world has to offer. And the American public knows this, and this is why there's been so much reluctance uh, to support policies that explicitly would restrict access to new technologies or restrict access uh, to, to coverage of, uh, of innovative treatments. But this is why we're really between a rock and a hard place now, because as I showed you on the previous slide, continuing to do what we've been doing, value as it's been, uh, valuable as it's been, doesn't seem like it's sustainable. So what I want to talk about for the rest of the time is the rest of the things on the introductory slide, which is how we can do better uh, with the same resources or how we can hopefully do more with less. I'm going to first talk about it from the standpoint of uh, the innovation process and then spend a bit of time around uh, payment policies and the financing of health care. Uh, I think this all fits together or rather it ne all needs to fit together if we're going to be doing more to uh, promote personalized care. What we've been doing in the past, uh, seeing health care costs go up, trying to control costs by squeezing down prices, restricting access using kind of blunt tools is not going to work. At the same time, we can't just put more and more money uh, using the same tools we've been using in the past into our health care system because that's not sustainable. We really have to do some things differently. That's why this conference and everything that you all are working on is so important. Uh, we're going to get to an era of more personalized medicine. The only question is how long it's going to take, how hard it's going to be, and how much else we're going to have to give up in, in our society in order to accomplish that goal. And that's where uh, what you all are doing makes such a big difference. So uh, this is a, a chart showing uh, what's been happening with the, uh, the uh, approval of new drugs at the FDA uh, and as, you, as we've headed into the recent uh, reform debate around the uh, uh, FDA um, uh, user fee acts, which are uh, now very close to, uh, to getting reenacted for the next five years, there's been a lot of discussion about how uh, there, there may be some challenges in the process. Maybe it's become too burdensome, too costly. Um, I think the good news is that the number of uh, new drug approvals is starting to trend up. FDA will remind you, just as I did when I was commissioner, that uh, if you look over time, what, what changes is not so much um, the number or the rate at which uh, uh, drugs that are submitted to FDA get approved, but rather the um, number that get approved. So you know, when you see these downturns like in 
2006, uh, 2007, um, that was not because FDA uh, started turning down uh, lots more applications, it's because fewer applications were coming in. And I want to come back to this point about you know, what's needed for, for getting towards more personalized care uh, and more personalized uh, uh, targeted treatment approvals. Um, so uh, given the, uh, uh, the, the, the concerns around getting new treatments to patients faster, uh, FDA has long had a number of mechanisms in place, and I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on these uh, with you all. Fast track uh, is for promising treatments uh, that lead, and when, when you get that designation, you have more uh, interaction with the, the, the regulatory agency uh, and uh, uh, presumably more feedback and guidance. It's used fairly widely, uh, close to 40 percent of the drugs that were approved last year. Priority review, uh, this is something that comes in the back end. This is what most people think of when they think about, okay, what does FDA do for uh, really valuable drugs? Well, they give them a priority review time, which means four months less. Um, it used to be six months versus 10 months. Now it's going to be eight months versus 12 months uh, for FDA to take all the information that a sponsor sends in and uh, make a decision about whether or not the, the product is approved or not. Uh, and you get four months less time if the FDA designates that this is kind of a, a therapy that's a substantial improvement uh, over existing treatments. That was used in almost half of cases. And again, as I showed you on that previous slide, that that's, hasn't changed a lot uh, in recent years. So it's a fairly common uh, step for, for trying to squeeze down the time for getting uh, treat new treatments to patients. Uh, another important pathway is accelerated approval. Uh, you heard some discussion this morning and uh, at, over lunch with Dr. Mukherjee about uh, how the future in cancer care may relate more to um, uh, using surrogate endpoints or markers of when patients are responding uh, and sort of models, uh, more clinically informed models of diseases. Um, this is an approach that has been used in some uh, cancer therapies where the approval is based on surrogate endpoints and then studies are supposed to be done after the treatment's approved in phase four uh, to confirm that there really is a clinical benefit. Um, there have been some controversies around this in recent years. Um, what I want to emphasize, though, is that uh, that doesn't account for a very large share of treatments that come to market today. It's 9% uh, last year, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One may be that it's just not that hard to do a trial in some conditions for a real clinical endpoint, for acute conditions where you don't have to wait very long to uh, observe whether or not a patient's responding clinically, uh, you don't need something like accelerated approval. On the other hand, it may be due to the fact that we don't have validated markers for when patients are really responding. And this brings me to the, the next thing that I want to emphasize, is that um, while there are a number of new steps in the legislation that's just being enacted now that will, uh, that are intended to, and I think will, have a, a, a positive impact on reducing uh, uh, regulatory time and making the regulatory process more efficient. Uh, these include uh, steps to improve the accelerated approval pathway that I just described. Uh, it includes a new uh, breakthrough therapy designation, which I think uh, could turn out to be quite useful for targeted therapies where uh, a subgroup of patients have been identified as being very responsive, so it fits very much with the, the personalized medicine uh, uh, theme. I think these are going to be important steps for making the review time shorter. Uh, but if you think about the overall process of developing a treatment and then getting it uh, into use, the time when the FDA is actually spending with that treatment is pretty limited out of the whole development time. And this development time can be uh, 8, 10, 12 years uh, with uh, uh, failures uh, uh, in a lot of places uh, and complications in a lot of places before the treatment ever gets to the FDA. And that's where better predictive modeling, which is supposed to be the promise of personalized medicine and all that, we understand, all that we're starting to understand better about you know, which uh, combinations of gene modifications lead to uh, uh, cancer uh, disease pathways and which patients and how they progress and so forth, all that should make this whole development process more predictable and more efficient. And that is starting to happen, but boy, we've got a long way to go. Uh, these are data uh, taken from a study that's published around 2004, 2005, so it's older. And you can see oncology is that really low uh, bar in the middle. Uh, percentage of successes of drugs that make it into human testing, around 6%. That's gotten better since then with some more progress on, uh, on using these kind of targeted uh, models, uh, but still a long way to go. Uh, some, uh, uh, and some more recent studies show the same thing, uh, that there are, is a lot of investment in treatments, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money uh, that uh, make it through phase two, which involves um, you know, a significant number of patients to, to show uh, efficacy, make it, through, make it to phase three, which are the larger studies which address some of the safety issues too. 
uh, but then don't ultimately end up panning out. Uh, we still have a long way of go to go in terms of, you know, I know the main conference theme here is predictive medicine, uh, but how about predictive research and development? Um, still have a, a, a ways to go there, some important progress, uh, but, but some ways to go. And so if you think about what could really help, yes, some of these steps that the, the user fee legislation is taking to uh, improve the accelerated approval regulatory pathway, the new uh, breakthrough designation, uh, more resources to FDA for handling their regulatory review, all very important, but what we really need is some improvements in the development science itself to, to really bring the tools of personalized medicine to more personalized treatment development. Uh, some of the things that I'd like to highlight here because there is good progress going on, you talked about some of this morning, uh, include better models. So uh, if we uh, really do have a sophisticated understanding of the, of the uh, uh, molecular and uh, um, uh, fundamental mechanisms of cancer development in particular patients, uh, that should translate into much better models of how different forms of cancer or a particular cancer will progress in different individuals. Uh, that should be something that can factor into how you select patients for clinical trials, uh, how you track them and how you uh, understand whether uh, the, the treatments are having an impact over time. Markers, so we talked about markers uh, already, that surrogate endpoints uh, need to be validated to, to show that there is a real improvement uh, in clinical outcomes. There are a lot of diagnostic tests out there uh, uh, that, that could be indicators and a lot more coming, imaging, uh, biochemical, uh, genetic, uh, uh, what have you, that could be indicators both of which patients are respond or likely to respond or have toxicities and when they're actually responding much faster than waiting for a, a clinical outcome. Uh, but those studies need to be, those uh, markers need to be validated. Uh, and you heard today from Laura Esserman and others about more efficient uh, methods for clinical trial design. Uh, those, I think, uh, we were just talking, about, just talking with Marsha about this before we started, that um, that's becoming less the exception and hopefully more like the rule, but again, still, uh, still a ways to go. I think what most of these developments have in common is that they're very difficult for one research lab, however good it is, one academic center, uh, or one company, however knowledgeable it is about a particular disease area to do by themselves. Uh, because uh, if we're talking about more um, uh, 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 limited numbers of patients, more specific subgroups, uh, no, number one, uh, having a larger population to draw from in uh, doing these validation studies and in developing the, the disease progression models and the like is very helpful. And number two, uh, there is a need for validation of the models. You know, are these uh, approaches replicable across centers? Are we using common enough methods that uh, if it happens in, if it's done in one center or one research lab, that we can be confident that's going to be replicated elsewhere? Certainly very important for FDA, and I think you'll hear from some payers uh, uh, this afternoon as well. You know, they, they want to see that kind kind of, uh, of evidence, and that means finding some ways to, you know, still having, uh, you know, competition among research labs for grants, competition among companies uh, to develop the best new treatment in a particular area still needs to happen, but that competition would be so much more efficient if there was better pre-competitive sharing uh, of common, you know, so don't, you know, there, nobody needs to compete on the, the underlying uh, disease model. Nobody needs to compete on the validity of uh, the marker we need to compete on is how well do the treatments work, how, how much of a difference are we making uh, in patient care. So having new collaborations to support that could be really helpful. And here I want to put in a very brief uh, but important plug for the Reagan Udall Foundation. Uh, I'm the chair of the board for this foundation, which some of you may remember since uh, Marge and others uh, uh, helped us uh, uh, get it in, help, help get it into legislation and help me uh, and uh, Ellen Siegel and, and many other people who are uh, much uh, more uh, involved and made much more difference in uh, cancer care than I have, get it off the ground. It certainly has had a uh, big uh, 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 emphasis from the start on trying to improve cancer care, uh, but it has it had a slow start. We did not get uh, appropriations because of some concerns about whether or not uh, these kinds of collaborations on uh, pre-competitive, non-regulatory issues, these collaborations around improving the science of product development uh, represented uh, a, a concerning direction for interaction between FDA, industry, other stakeholders. You know, FDA needs to preserve its, its independence in interpreting evidence and certainly in um, dealing with specific uh, regulatory decisions that come before it. That's not the role of this foundation. And over time, we've been able to, to clarify that role and move towards uh, getting some of those uh, uh, appropriations that were intended in the 2007 FDA reform law in place. Uh, so now we are ready to go. Uh, we're ready to advance the mission of the FDA by furthering regulatory science and research, 
with the ultimate goal of improving public health. Uh, this is a statutory organization in which the FDA is specifically directed to work with uh, industry, patient groups, academia, other government entities in support of the kinds of goals that I showed uh, on the previous slide. Um, this is just, uh, as I said, getting off the ground now. We're um, starting programs in three major areas. One is uh, safety and better evidence. This includes some collaborations around better post-market science, uh, active surveillance. I'll talk more about some of those ideas in a second. Uh, it includes uh, pre-competitive standards and data analysis program, like a, a program that I'm used to illustrate uh, uh, what uh, Reagan Udall is doing. It includes building scientific capacity. Uh, one of the uh, major things the foundation is going to do is uh, bring in some more scientific expertise to the FDA through fellowship programs and try to uh, enable FDA uh, staff and people who work with the FDA to get more up-to-date knowledge and more direct experience with some of the new techniques that are being used for uh, supporting personalized product development. This is an, an illustration of a, a pilot uh, project that we got underway last year, even before starting sort of the full uh, implementation of the, the foundation. Now uh, is a predictive toxicology program involving oncology drugs. And again, this fits with what I was trying to uh, describe before of uh, uh, pooling experience across uh, researchers, uh, government uh, experts, and uh, industry, and others uh, with regard to how well we can predict which uh, cancer drugs may cause toxicity uh, in individual patients. Um, the the um, initial project here has focused on uh, cardiotoxicity associated with tyrosine kinase inhibitors may seem like a, a narrow area, but uh, uh, all of this is, uh, uh, is very, is, you know, we're getting very personalized. And what the, the project is doing is, again, through a, the, the neutral convening that, that uh, the Reagan Udall Foundation was explicitly set up to do, uh, working with guidance from the FDA and input from all these other stakeholders, is compiling F, uh, existing data uh, and identifying uh, ways to use it to describe and better model uh, some of the common uh, toxic biological pathways uh, and uh, uh, by pooling data do a better job of describing the, uh, the, the, the predictive uh, aspects of, uh, of, of tyrosine kinase uh, toxicity. Uh, so there, there are a lot of collaborations like this. I don't mean to just talk about the Reagan Udall Foundation. What I do want to emphasize is that we're not going to make progress, I think, on, uh, on getting personalized medicines uh, into cancer care nearly as quickly unless uh, there is both uh, uh, financial investment and, uh, more importantly, uh, sort of shared uh, expertise in these kinds of collaborations to uh, overcome those barriers to, to treatment development. Now, in my uh, last few minutes, uh, maybe I should take a breath for a second. No, was it? Uh, in my last few minutes, I want to talk about um, the, the financing and delivery side. So that was kind of the, uh, the, the treatment development side. And you know, here's where you know, I just want to emphasize again that if you look overall, on average, even for conditions uh, like some of the common cancers where people have been concerned until recent years that we weren't seeing improvements in population mortality, even though we were seeing increases in cost, even in those cases, uh, the spending on average has been worth the increased cost. Uh, where we need to do better, though, is that there are plenty of examples of where we aren't using the biomedical knowledge that we have effectively, where we're missing opportunities to prevent uh, costly complications, where we're uh, treating chronic diseases uh, uh, without, uh, uh, with, with big gaps between actual treatment and uh, what the uh, evidence base suggests we should be doing, where we aren't coordinating care well, where patients are having complications uh, because their personalized needs uh, for pain management or uh, preferences when they have very ser serious illnesses aren't being uh, effectively reflected in the way that care is delivered, uh, and on and on and on. Uh, and we don't seem to be getting there with the way that we're delivering care today. And in the United States, that's largely based on, has uh, traditionally been based on fee-for-service payments where there's one payment for a particular service and the payment sort of depends on the intensity of that service, not on the impact of that treatment or combination of treatments in a particular patient. Uh, and many services that weren't part of the traditional uh, fee-for-service list uh, aren't included, things like a care coordination or spending more time uh, understanding a patient's preferences or helping to support them uh, in getting the, the kind of um, uh, post-acute or supportive care uh, that they need. Uh, so how do we get from here to there uh, in terms of having more personalized care? Well, one way would be to try to uh, add all these additional kinds of services for all the 
patients that might benefit into our fee-for-service payment systems. The problem with that approach is what I showed you on the first slide, that if we just add more things in to the way we're delivering care now, uh, costs, actuaries will tell you, and they're going to be right, costs are almost certainly going to go up, and we won't have done anything to address all those inefficiencies uh, in our current system. So most of the most promising reforms that I think are out there today are ones that take the, the fee-for-service system that really is just not designed for personalized care, right? I mean, uh, some of these... Uh, very costly treatments uh, may be extremely valuable in some patients and not, not very beneficial at all in others, and, and we're not doing a very good job of supporting that with uh, kind of blunt instrument price regulation or restrictions on access. So moving from that to, to payments, to support that's more directly related to what we really care about, better results at a lower overall cost for patients. And that's a big challenge. You talked about some of that this morning, and you're going to talk about it on the next panel, so let me just highlight uh, a few issues that I think are relevant. Uh, most relevant is we can't uh, spend money on things that we really want to spend money on uh, if we can't measure it. Um, that's just a, a, a fact of payment. Uh, we don't have unlimited resources to spend uh, in healthcare. So one thing that's very important is being able to get more data and more uh, data turning into knowledge out of our existing uh, healthcare system. I want to give you one example of this. You heard about Laura Esserman's network for uh, uh, doing uh, adaptive trial designs for, uh, uh, for oncology treatments where, you know, now we should be moving into an era where, you know, the, the trial networks are continuously available and the, just the, the, the nature of the treatments, the nature of the patients included in particular studies uh, evolves with knowledge over time. Um, having that kind of capacity in our healthcare system overall is not something I think that's that far away. Um, this is a, a slide that's intended to summarize the Sentinel initiative. This is a um, uh, collaboration on post-market safety surveillance that was started in the private sector is now expanded to include Medicare and the VA and, and other programs. And uh, basically the way this program works is uh, through a shared governance process, uh, health plans, major healthcare organizations like, uh, like uh, Partners and Geisinger, or Kaiser, and others have committed to developing a common data model, you know, so that fits with that theme that I was talking about a few minutes ago, uh, for interpreting their own data uh, on their own patients and sharing it, uh, sharing summary information from their cases in a, in a consistent way. So uh, all the data doesn't have to go to learn, all the data doesn't have to go into a big uh, warehouse somewhere with all kinds of privacy issues and proprietary issues and things like that. The data stays at home uh, behind the firewall. See, that's a firewall, that little flame thing with the, uh, the wall firewall, get it? Um, so like data partner one might be Kaiser, data partner two might be Geisinger and so forth. Uh, they have a lot of inform information, evidence that they're using increasingly sophisticated electronic data for patient management. And what uh, this program needs is sort of summary information on for a particular drug, say uh, uh, a particular kind of treatment for a particular cancer, uh, how many patients did you have that got that treatment and how many of them had certain well-defined uh, clinical complications. And it's really just that summary information that, that's needed to reach uh, the broader evidence conclusions, not, you know, whether Mrs. Smith went to the doctor last Tuesday to get her chemotherapy and was admitted to the emergency room on uh, Saturday, but how many patients like that did each plan have? If you've got a common data model, you just share the summary information, uh, then you can get uh, a much better picture of what's going on in the overall population. That's what I sort of you know, and this is around safety surveillance, which is not a competitive issue. I mean, uh, as long as these studies are done right, using uh, good definitions for data models, using good uh, uh, statistical modeling for understanding that, you know, we're dealing with observational data, so these are associations, not necessarily causal relationships. Everybody wants to know these answers. The manufacturers, the, the physicians involved in providing care, the payers, everybody. And the only way to get it, because many of these side effects, especially for particular subpopulations, are rare, uh, is to do a network approach like this. So this is actually up and running now for safety surveillance questions. FDA is using the, the mini Sentinel network, evolving into the Sentinel network uh, right now with covering more something like 150 million lives, in effect, across uh, the United States, public and private programs. Um, that's, an issue, that's an example related to drug safety surveillance. Uh, if we could get better measures of other things that we care about, then we could do a better job of supporting improvements in quality uh, and improvements in the efficiency and value of care in actual practice. And uh, this is a, a chart that's meant to summarize some of the, the progress that's ongoing now in measuring what we uh, really should care about. So it's not just the volume and intensity of procedures and lab tests and how long patients spend in the hospital and who got MRI and 
and who got which particular uh, uh, drug combination, now th although those are important, uh, it's what are the consequences for patients me measured on more of an ongoing basis. So there's some measures for things that we care about that can come from insurance claims data, like whether or not people got breast cancer screening and other colorectal cancer screening, uh, whether or not patients with chronic diseases got, like diabetes got evidence-based uh, 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 monitoring procedures. Uh, However, the most more important uh, measures are, are further down on this slide, so measures that rely on data from electronic records or other clinical uh, sources. You don't necessarily need a full electronic record to make these kinds of programs work. Um, so these might be uh, things like uh, 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 biomarkers uh, for, uh, we've got good ones for conditions like diabetes, like hemoglobin A1C levels, a good measure of how much uh, uh, extra uh, uh, glucose there is in, blood, in, the, in the blood over time. We don't have as good measures uh, for, for many aspects of cancer care quality and outcomes. That gets back to what I was talking about on the earlier side. The more that we can validate markers for, for whether or not patients are making progress uh, for their particular cancer, it's very important for making clinical trials more efficient, but it's also really important as a, as a market that could be collected on an ongoing basis, could come out of our actual systems used to, data systems used to deliver care effectively uh, to let us know whether we're making progress uh, and whether different certain medical centers or, or providers are, are making progress in, uh, in, in cancer care. And obviously, I think what's most important for long term is going to be increasing reliance on self-reported measures is starting to happen in quality and payment systems now for things like patient experience and overall health status. Uh, obviously, a tremendous amount of potential with uh, smartphones and other uh, input mechanisms for uh, making care for cancer uh, much more related to what really matters to patients as opposed to, you know, thing, clinical measures that uh, we can come up with from, from claims data and the like. So supporting uh, collaborations uh, within our healthcare system, within healthcare delivery, so that we get better measures of what we really want cancer patients to get, better results, lower overall cost, is a foundation uh, to making changes in our policies to get us to more personalized medicine and more effective personalized medicine faster, uh, and that's what these kind of techniques can do. Um, I just want to, with those measures, talk briefly about payment, benefit, and uh, uh, something to look out for in uh, healthcare reform. Um, so uh, with these better measures of quality, you can think about payment systems that aren't just about volume and intensity, which is, again, uh, has, has, has worked to get more treatments out to more patients, but is turning out to be quite uh, expensive and leading to, to quite a lot of gaps in uh, uh, evidence-based care, you can start moving those systems to this idea of shared savings. And I, I know many of you have, have, uh, are familiar with this, and some of you have had some discussion about it already this morning. Um, the, the way that uh, I was first exposed to the idea of shared savings when I was uh, 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 administrator at CMS, and a bunch of heads of physician group practices came in and started talking to me about all the things they were doing to try and improve care uh, for their patients, including uh, with respect to cancer care, like uh, uh, doing outreach to get patients to use uh, colorectal cancer screening, breast cancer screening more effectively, especially the, the subgroups of patients that they had identified uh, in their records as being at higher risk, uh, steps that they were taking for patients with chronic diseases, including uh, uh, many cancers, to make sure that they were getting evidence-based treatment by relying on nurse practitioners and, uh, and care coordination teams, uh, steps to uh, prevent complications after serious hospitalizations, major operations and the like, uh, by supporting better transitions in care, uh, steps to avoid duplication of tests uh, by you know, adopting electronic records and the like. And Mark, you know, here's the evidence that all these, uh, here's the measures showing that all these treatments are improving care for the population we serve. Uh, here's some measures showing that they're reducing costs. The problem is we're getting killed. Number one, Medicare doesn't pay for any of those things that I just mentioned, and most fee-for-service programs don't. And number two, to the extent that these, pro these initiatives work, we get paid less for the stuff that Medicare does pay for because the patients are getting them into the hospital less, they're going to the emergency room less, they may even go into their doctors less if they're getting their emails answered and, and relying on smartphones. So we need a different payment system. Uh, Medicare didn't have any great mechanisms for that. We were a fee-for-service payment system uh, at its core. So we set up a pilot program, uh, called a shared savings program called the Physician Group Practice Demonstration where the providers kept getting their fee-for-service payments just like they had traditionally, but in addition, they started reporting to us on a set of performance measures that we both agreed, that Medicare and the providers agreed, were important for the populations they serve. Things like measures of 
uh, of use of preventive services, evidence-based preventive services in their population, things like preventing hospitalizations and other avoidable or potentially avoidable complications uh, in their patient populations, things like uh, outcome measures, biomarkers for, uh, for diabetes, for, for heart disease and so forth that could be tracked uh, in their population, things like uh, patient experience with care and overall health status. And the deal was they could improve on most of these dimensions of quality. If Medicare at the same time saw a reduction in overall cost trends, they could keep most of the savings above a threshold. Uh, we chose a 2% threshold to make sure that these savings wouldn't occur just by uh, random chance and uh, you know, our actuaries don't like us paying out extra money. Uh, and um, also to, to share in the savings beyond that level. Now five years in, uh, there's been a lot of studies of these kinds of programs. Uh, my takeaway was that this is a very good start. Five out of the ten programs saved more than two percentage points per year, which would flatten out that increasing red on that first graph that I showed you. Uh, all of the programs significantly improved in these important dimensions of quality of care, and all of those programs have significantly expanded their move from uh, traditional fee-for-service to shared savings. Um, and, you know, think of it as like, you know, you're, we, we can't um, just stop and start over with our health care payment systems or delivery systems. And we have to do all this on the fly because you know, we got to deliver care to patients who really need our help uh, right now, and they're really nervous, understandably, about uh, getting access and not having their access disrupted to uh, uh, effective treatments. So uh, an incremental way of implementing these fundamental changes is to start out with shared savings and gradually put more of the resources as, as providers and payers and everyone who's more familiar with these systems, take the resources out of fee-for-service, tie them more to getting better results at a lower cost. We do a better job of measuring that, and you know, these kinds of systems support all the reforms and electronic records and care coordination and delivery that can support more personalized care. So it can be incremental steps towards fundamental change, just shift the weight from the first track of payment to the second track of payment uh, over time. Um, so these were those um, group practice demonstrations that I talked about that we set up in 2005. There were 10 uh, around the country. We just finished our third uh, ACO summit last week, uh, something we do with, uh, with Dartmouth, uh, and uh, had over 250 self-identified ACOs participating in that effort one way or another. And these are now in Medicare. Medicare's got more than 60 uh, accountable care organizations that are moving towards these kinds of payments. Uh, uh, they're even more prevalent in the, in the private sector, uh, both uh, um, uh, hospital-based group, physician uh, group-based uh, practices, in some cases regional collaborations like uh, uh, the Beacon communities, all having this common uh, feature. They're doing it in different ways, but it's common features and moving from paying based on volume and intensity to measuring and doing a better job of supporting improvements in quality and, tying, and reductions in overall costs and tying payments to support uh, those kinds of efforts. Um, I talk mainly about um, accountable care organizations, but medical homes, uh, bundled payments, as long as they're tied to accountability for better results, lower costs, these same kinds of performance measures can help move in that direction. Again, this is not an overnight thing. The measures are not perfect. Uh, there, there are a lot of factors besides what we can measure that influence outcomes. So that's a good reason not to do all of this uh, too uh, rapidly and, and all of a sudden. Uh, but uh, that's why the, the kind of incremental paths to getting there with these different components of reform are important. Uh, and this is not just about paying providers, it's also about paying for innovative treatments. So these are some examples on this slide of payments for innovative drugs that are moving away from volume intensity. You know, the, the traditional drug payment contract is uh, you negotiate a price, so there's a Maybe it's a regulated price, maybe it's a negotiated price, but you set a price and then the payments are based on volume. Uh, so same thing, same kind of change can happen here, moving from paying based on volume to paying based on better results at a lower cost. This has happened, uh, I think, more outside the U.S. than in uh, because of issues around you know, cost effectiveness ratios and uh, uh, NICE and, and so forth and, uh, um, in the U.K. and some other uh, European countries, um, but uh, I think it's potentially relevant here too for treatments that may be used in, especially in combinations where uh, the, the particular patients may get them, may either benefit a lot uh, or may benefit not that much depending on their genomic factors and the other things that go into the personalized medicine decisions that are a big focus here. Uh, this moves the payments in the direction of outcomes. Now obviously what matters is having a good uh, outcome measure and those are more prevalent and more in use outside of cancer frankly than within. That gets back to that measurement problem that I described before. So for example, uh, uh, beta serum is a treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. It's very expensive. It's gotten on the preferred tier for a number of drug plans through these kinds of value-based payment designs where uh, the, the rebate for the drug is 
basically tied to whether or not the patients who get it have a reduction in their hospitalizations with flare-up of their rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the uh, Axonel uh, example uh, with uh, Procter & Gamble and Sanofi, uh, in that case, the rebate is effectively tied towards whether or not patients have hip fractures and other kinds of non-vertebral fractures for osteoporosis. Uh, and the idea is that if the drug helps prevent those fractures, then the drug gets paid more because it's helping to move in this direction of preventive overall cost reductions. Uh, if there are more complications, if the drug doesn't have an impact, it doesn't bring down rates compared to the other treatments that would be available. Uh, it, it, gets, uh, it gets reimbursed less. Again, the, the measures are very important. Um, I'm going to very briefly extend this to, to benefit design. Um, when uh, Medicare Part D was implemented, you know, there's a lot of competition uh, among different kinds of, among different plans and differences in uh, 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 benefits being offered that were not kind of the traditional insurance. The, the plans that, um, uh, that seniors most chose were plans that had uh, not deductibles, then 25% coinsurance, and then catastrophic coverage on the back end, but tiered benefit designs where the generic drugs were basically free, where drugs that um, had lower prices negotiated with a manufacturer, preferred brand name drug, it might be 20 or 30 bucks, most everything else was covered, but compared to a traditional insurance design, patients saved a lot more money if they found a lower cost way of meeting their medical needs. And when Medicare Part D was implemented, um, we saw a much lower cost of the program than had been predicted. And in good part, there were a lot of reasons for this, but uh, one major reason is that seniors hugely shifted from using brand to generic drugs. So the use of, of generic drugs went from about 50% in 2006 to close to 80% today. They also switched from non-preferred to preferred brand name drugs. And those are big savings in cost. Now, these same kinds of models, these are based on measures. Seniors, wh whatever they say, they basically concluded that for many conditions that they had, generic drugs they viewed as equivalent to brand name drugs. So they, so they took the savings. We aren't there yet for many other aspects of healthcare, like where you get your cancer care, uh, where you get elective surgical procedures and the like, but with better performance measures, I think more of this kind of tiering and benefit design is coming to the rest of care so that it you know, makes for a better way of targeting resources if we have good measures, if we can implement these programs successfully to the providers, to the systems of care that can get better results, more personalized results for patients at a lower cost without having to try to build in uh, all of these specific rules into uh, what would be a very bureaucratic coverage process. Uh, it leaves the decisions to the doctors and the patients, but what I've talked to you about, both on the provider side through the, the shared savings payment reforms and the accountable care payment reforms, and the patient side through uh, these kinds of benefit design, so-called value-based benefit design reforms, uh, mean that they have more of the accountability. They have more control of the resources, which seems like a much better fit with the move towards personalized medicine. One thing to worry about in these kinds of systems with insurance choice, and then we got a Supreme Court decision coming up under uh, about the new mandate and so forth, uh, is adverse selection. Uh, one way to undermine uh, the, uh, the, the financial support that, that has worked out reasonably well in Part D, definitely not perfectly, but reasonably well in terms of access to innovative medicines, is to uh, punish the, the plans and the providers that attract uh, and keep the, the less healthy, higher risk patients. And the fact of the matter is, with uh, better predictive modeling of genomics of cancer, better predictive modeling uh, through these marker processes, we are gonna get much better at identifying who's higher risk and who's lower risk and what their costs are, uh, are going to be. I think it's not just a matter of genetic testing and, and the like, and there's some regu federal regulations on that. It's really the sum total of our ability to do predictive medicine. And that means uh, we need to take some steps to make sure uh, that we are still providing the right incentives and the right support for health plans and providers that attract and keep uh, the less healthy patients. This is a list of some of the steps, some of which are included in the ACA. I, I don't think those are, are going to go far enough. I think we're going to need to take more steps uh, in this direction, especially if the mandate gets overturned uh, by the Supreme Court, or as I think will happen if uh, the Supreme Court doesn't overturn it, uh, if Congress takes action to, to defer its implementation or further, uh, further limits, limit its impact in uh, 2014. Uh, and beyond. So uh, I've tried to cover a lot of ground both on the development side and on the healthcare delivery side of some of the things that I think are needed from a policy standpoint to support all of those great goals, all that tremendous potential uh, that, that PMC and 
uh, AACR, all of you are, are devoted to in terms of uh, improving care for patients uh, by making the most of these very important fundamental trends in biomedical science towards more personalized care. Uh, I think all these steps uh, are uh, I think uh, we're headed in this direction uh, inevitably. I think the question is just how quickly and how effectively can we get there, uh, and hopefully through conferences like this and discussion and the leadership that you all are providing, we can get there as fast as possible. Thank you very much for the opportunity to join you today. Mark, thanks so much uh, for that enlightening talk. Do you have time for one question? Sure, one or two. Yeah. <laughs> One question for Mark. Uh, so I'll pose one. Um, this group has convened for the purpose of aligning the scientific opportunities with the policy opportunities. And we hope that um, at the end of the day will not be the end of that effort, but rather the beginning of it. And if there were one message you could give to us who have gathered here today to carry that forward, what would it be? Well, I think the main message would be to carry on with what you're doing, uh, the, the connections between uh, biomedical research and development science and the delivery of care are hopefully going to become tighter and tighter so that it gets to be more of a continuum, very much like those uh, adaptive trial design networks. We can incorporate all this evidence as it's developed uh, more quickly. Um, but if there's one specific area where I think there, there's not enough uh, being done, it's in, this, uh, in, in the area of, of validating whether uh, diagnostic tests, whether other pre potential predictive models really do work in a way that makes sense and seems valid to payers, to uh, people who are writing evidence-based guidelines, uh, to people who are delivering care. Uh, if we could get more of those markers for cancer into place, we'll end up with uh, uh, conditions that I think are, you know, HIV benefited a lot from having to go from uh, doing clinical trials where I have to wait till patients die or develop opportunistic inf in infections to using viral load measures that can be measured in just a few weeks, hepatitis C innovation just this past year, uh, breakthrough drugs got approved, multiple breakthrough got, drugs got approved because there were valid markers based on hep C uh, viral loads that took just a few weeks to observe rather than, you know, the, the, the long-term sequelae of, uh, of, of liver cancer. We don't have as much of that as, uh, as we really need for, for cancer care, and I think it's really uh, uh, slowing the development process and could get in the way of bringing a lot of these targeted therapies into uh, routine clinical practice, hopefully high-quality clinical practice. Right. That's Thank very helpful. Thank, Thank you, you all again. very much. Thank you.